Welcome to Reluctantly Supernatural in an Age of Reason, the podcast where we explore the place of the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the church. Our hosts, Pastors Mark Cowpersmith and Bob Maddox, combine their years of ministry experience to address the issues of the prophetic gifts in our modern world. Join us as they interview their guests from a wide variety of spiritual leadership backgrounds, as they share their insights on the place of the supernatural in the church and the world. And now, our hosts, Mark Cowpersmith and Bob Maddox. Glad you've joined us today on our podcast. I'm here with uh, my co-author and friend and colleague, uh, Mark uh, Cowpersmith. And we're really excited also today that we have with us Mark DuPont, and he's going to be responding to some of our questions we're just very, very honored to have him on today. But I'm going to kind of toss this to Mark. But before I do, uh, we're not in our studio as we normally would be uh, because we're all kind of quarantined. So we're coming remotely from various places. And uh, we're grateful today to do this. So I'm going to toss it to Mark uh, Coppersmith and he can kind of open our meeting today. Well, welcome to our podcast, Mark. It's really a, a privilege and a pleasure to have you on. And I'm going to start with a question that it always intrigues me. The speakers, uh, the ministers that I respect most, they all have a life message. They have some central truth that informs and forms their thinking and their life. And I'm curious about what yours might be. Well, it's, uh, first of all, it's a, a blessing to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, looking forward to getting to you know, know you better in the future. I've known Bob for the last couple of years, and it's been such a privilege hanging out with him and hearing his testimony. Um, for me, my life message, I think, would be uh, really having a heart knowledge of God. Um, uh, for over 38 years now, I guess we're going into our 39th year, uh, we've been involved in international ministry. Uh, uh, sometimes it smacks of evangelism or sometimes apostolically coaching pastors and leaders, but primarily it's come under the banner of the prophetic, and we try to avoid the pathetic, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, it's, I, I have likened it unto a, a Barnabas ministry of encouragement, and Barnabas, as we know, the son of encouragement, uh, he was the one that saw the, the calling on Paul when hardly anybody wanted to associate with Paul, and left the revival at Antioch, brought him to the party, and was there that he and uh, Paul were launched out on their first apostolic trip. And um, for me, a, a, a huge part of our ministry, and we go to a wide variety of churches, a wide variety of denominations, is hopefully prophetically calling people into their potential and calling churches into their potential in God. Um, a life verse for me would be 1 Corinthians 2, 9, that God has more for us than our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, more than we can understand. And I believe it's the prophetic, whether it comes to a dream or a vision to a person directly from the Holy Spirit or possibly a prophetic word, uh, somebody in the body of Christ may share to somebody else. But as we take those seeds and we begin to pray into them and we nurture them through obedience in the small steps, we began to see that God really does have so much more for us in the abilities and talents he's put within us to serve him and have fruitful lives. That's excellent. Truly excellent. Um, let me ask you a question. I looked at your uh, website and there were three basic areas of impartation that you listed. The first was encouraging and releasing spiritual gifts. And the second was seeing people hear clearly and directly from the Holy Spirit about the Father's compassion and sovereignty. And the third was ministry and healing. And uh, I'm curious, if you only had opportunity to speak about one of those things at a conference, which one would you choose and why? Oh, um, I think it would, uh, a foundation message to everything we do is the Father's love for each of us as his sons and daughters. Uh, not only for many people who do not know Christ Jesus, but in, even for many people in the body of Christ, um, uh, I, I believe they're living out of what could be called or what is being called an orphan spirit. Um, you know, meaning we're, uh, we, we feel like we're outside looking in. 
And as Paul said, God has not given us a spirit of slavery, taking us back into fear, where we feel like we need to strive or achieve something to earn the blessings of God. But we've been adopted. We've been given the spirit of adoption or spirit of sonship, as some call it. And we've been born again into a father-child uh, relationship. And the Holy Spirit within us is calling Abba Father. So when I teach our, our different schools, like on knowing the voice of God or learning to pray for the sick or vision and destiny, Tabernacle of David, whatever it is, uh, or even if I'm preaching on something a little bit different than that, uh, to me, woven into the message is always um, what Jesus said in John 17, 3, Father, this is eternal life. They might know you and the Christ that you sent. And just knowing that Abba cry within us that because of what Jesus has done, um, you know, the, the orphan always feels like they're outside looking in. And I sometimes illustrate the orphan spirit by having people close their hand in a fist because the orphan, because they feel like they don't have very much. And if they lose or give away what they have, they'll be afraid to, there'll be nothing else afterwards. They hold tight to what they have. But in contrast to that, Jesus always lived open-handedly. And the problem with living close-handed is not only are we not free to give, but we're not free to receive from the Father. But we see Jesus always freely giving and serving out of the Father's love. And the flip side of living close-handedly, and we see this in evidence in many churches, many Christians, is when there's conflict between individuals in the body of Christ, or even conflict within a church between church leaders, we fall into the fight or flight syndrome, don't we? We either yes. get aggressive or else we run from the situation. But even when you run, you run with your, your fist closed, <laughs> don't you? Whereas yeah. Jesus on the cross in just great agony and pain, uh, just raising himself up through great torment through the, those pigs put through his feet, gasping for breath, he said these words, Father, forgive them. They don't know what to do. And so even in the greatest tensions of his life betrayed by uh, humanity, uh, you know, his hands were still, so to speak, open wide. And uh, 1 John 4.18, God's perfect love casts out fear. And so the freedom, I believe, to uh, thoroughly, if I could use this word, investigate life, explore life, go on the adventures God calls us to, rather than retreating and just holding tight in what we feel is safe. Uh, I believe that freedom comes from uh, being filled up with an ongoing revelation of God's love for us that casts out fear. Well, let me ask you a question about that. You've ministered in, I'm thinking probably, thousands of churches over many, many years in many, many cultures. Have you mentally, it's a calculation that I do, and I'm wondering if you do the same calculation. When I'm speaking to people about that very issue, the spirit of adoption, the experience of God's love, rather than the ideas of God's love, I'm always asking myself, I wonder what the percentages of people in this room right now who've really experienced the Father's love versus those that are operating out of that um, orphan spirit. They're working for him, but they don't really know his love. Do you have an opinion as to, through your experience, the sort of numbers of people that really understand this experience or have had it versus those that have an intellectual knowledge of his love but haven't had the heart-to-heart -heart experience of his love? No, I... I um... I'm, I'm not as creative in my thinking as I think you are, uh, uh, but I guess my, my take on it would be just as a kind of a uh, gut reaction would be probably less than 20%. Um, yeah. You know, you talked about the heart knowledge of God. That's the whole thing right there. Yeah. Jesus said the good man or the good woman speaks of the treasure stored up in their heart. Well, we've got a lot of Christians that can recite verses back at you yeah. and have somewhat of a grasp of a uh, theological grasp of the word of God. But the heart knowledge of God is what we really respond to when we're facing the issues of life. For, for example, right now, as so many people are facing all the what ifs with coronavirus, <laughs> we're living in a bit of isolation. We're living in uh, with a lot of jobs shut down. 
a lot of economic uh, questions and factors about the future. You know, uh, it's not that we don't all, all of us, myself included, all of a sudden we, we do have those what if thoughts coming to us. But the question is, are we going to allow the peace of God that passes on our standing to govern our souls, to govern our spirits? And that comes out of the heart knowledge. You know, we use the term, especially as charismatics and Pentecostals, being filled with the spirit. But the greatest side of being filled with the spirit, I believe, as Paul indicated, uh, is having a grateful heart, you know, always giving thanks to God, always making songs. And so the greatest sign of being filled with the goodness of God is not necessarily signs and wonders, revelation, but it's having a grateful heart and just a, a heart of uh, appreciation for God and what he's doing. You know? How do you go about leading people into that deeper experience of the love of God? Well, What's your approach to that? Well, as I said, we try to we try to weave the Father Heart of God message into a lot of what we do and a lot of the messages. Um, to be honest with you, um, uh, to me, it's it's <clears throat> it is the strategy of employing certain verses as you speak and certain uh, stories about God's love. But when I when I testify about healings and miracles, for example, or radical deliverances. I'll always tie it into the phrase, the love of God manifested, or, you know, God just loved this person so much, you know. But to be honest with you, I, I think a lot of it is anointing that we carry. And, uh, you know, it's uh, the Holy Spirit's ability to move through us, through our lives and our words, and being carriers of the presence of God. <clears throat> and I think it's something that Jesus said to his disciples, freely, freely receive, freely, freely give, that if we've got it and we're, we're in prayer about this, oh, Lord, you know, I, uh, I don't always pray this before every meeting I do, but before a lot of the meetings I do, I'll pray out of, you know, what something David said in the Psalms, Lord, these are your majestic ones in whom you delight, uh, including those that don't know Christ yet, but God's working in their lives. Lord, would you pour out a deep revelation of who you are to them beyond the, our intellectual ability to <clears throat> pull up verses and tell stories and have a clever sermon and sound bites and all of that. It's the anointing of God. Um, like the story you were telling about when you were speaking down in Mexico and all of a sudden you're not even allowed to finish your message, but people are raising their hands. They want <laughs> Jesus. Something's happening. Yeah. And it, and it has far more to do with the Spirit of God and His grace to us and through us than, you know, than our ability mechanically to put together a clever message. You know, and I you know, to, that, that, I go ahead, Bob. To, I was talking to a friend uh, up in Chico who has written a book about, it's called Love Revolution. And he's had this profound revelation of, you know, that, that we've lost that first commandment that Jesus gave, that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that was his one commandment that he left. And uh, we were talking about the, the very fact that you shared um, uh, just a few moments ago that so many of these uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit, they work by love. The Bible says faith works by love. Yeah. And, and so if we're going to have faith, we first of all have to have the love of God and compassion of God. And, and, but, but that kind of want, helps me segue into a question. You, you, uh, if, if there's a lot of churches that are not charismatic or Pentecostal, but they do have the love of God. But yeah. for some reason, they haven't learned to activate that uh, in connection with, uh, you know, pro prophecy or healing or some of these things. And how do you move people into that area? Um, you know, like, like a lot of people um, in the early 80s, uh, John Wimber had an impact upon my ministry. And one of the things... <clears throat> I can't remember the exact phrase he would have used, but he, he was uh, quite focused on, quote, demystifying the gifts of the Spirit. And I think when a lot of people in the body of Christ, whether they come from a Pentecostal or an evangelical or a, a liturgical background, when they think about prophesying, <clears throat> they immediately go to some mysterious figure like Elijah, Elisha, you know, sitting up on the hill waiting to call down fire, you know, <clears throat> all this sort of thing. But 
I believe that when we can present the spiritual gifts today, as Paul talked about them in 1 Corinthians 12, 14, the revelatory gifts, the power gifts, the discerning gifts, uh, speaking gifts, that if we can present them, that they're tools for doing the work of the kingdom. And so uh, a carpenter going down the road will have one set of tools, a hammer, a level, a saw. A plumber will have a different set of tools. An electrician, again, will have a different set of tools. And so if we think about the spiritual gifts as tools rather than trophies, Amen. And, and, I think, and I think what helps a lot is I love telling testimonies about healings and miracles and uh, uh, touches of the Holy Spirit, prophetic experiences that have changed people's lives. <clears throat> I think as we uh, who you know, are called to communicate this stuff, teach and preach on it, as we do it in a um, taking the focus off of ourselves, but just saying, you know, this is just stuff that God wants to do in the body of Christ. It's not for some spiritual elite, but it's for all of us. And, uh, and kind of de-emphasizing the, the mysterious and all of that. And uh, just saying, you know, uh, God is a God who speaks. Why does he speak? Because he loves his sons and daughters, you know, as any uh, loving father would. And also, I, <clears throat> I think there's, um, we're called to, uh, I think, use some discernment. For example, I fully believe in what Paul talked about, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about now because uh, things have changed a little bit. I think there's more of a, a biblical ignorance today than there was in the body of Christ 20 years ago. But it used to be if you went into an evangelical church and said, who needs to be baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit? That immediately is like waving a, a red flag at a bull. You know, all the theological um, warning lights go on. But I have found if I say, who here wants more of Jesus? I would get tons of people responding to that invitation. And then we pray for them. They end up getting baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow, that was really encouraging, Mark. What did you think about what he said? I thought it was great. There were a lot of things that he said that really touched my heart that I'm passionate about. So it was, it was one of those wonderful experiences of, ah, I agree with everything this guy's saying. This is really, really, this guy's really, really good. Yeah. Only because he agrees with me. But <laughs> it was great. What do you think? What, what did you take out of what he said? Well, I like the fact that one of the things I love is the fact that he is, he's getting open doors in every per denomination and group you could imagine. And I think this is a sign of where we're at right now. People are so hungry for God that even coming out of churches, I was talking to Winky last night uh, by a, a, a FaceTime call. And he was saying how down in New Zealand, there's is Baptist churches that have opened up to the moving of the Holy Spirit and revival and supernatural. So it's, it's neat to see that happening. That's exciting because I think that fits with what Mark DuPont said about um, the language that we use. If you go in and say, hey, how many people want to speak in tongues and have a fire dancing on your heads? <laughs> you don't get many volunteers, but if you say, how many people want more of Jesus in your life? Then, you're, th then you've got interested people. And really, right. the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Jesus. So when we're talking about more of Jesus, we automatically are talking about more of the Holy Spirit. Right. You know, I love, too, what he said about the, the, uh, uh, the need of people to really sense that God is their father. And, you know, years ago, uh, years ago when I was young in the ministry, we, we, we had this house for guys coming out of the counterculture, out of drugs and alcohol. And in the upstairs area of it, there had been some doves and the doves had fled away and their little baby doves had been left behind. And there were just two or three of them in this tiny list. And we didn't know what to do with it. Well, what, what was interesting is that, uh, excuse me, they're not doves, they were pigeons. So there were these little baby pigeons in this little uh, uh, shelter there, little uh, nest. And we had a guy who used to come to our ministry and he had an aviary. And he goes, listen, I'll take those little pigeons because doves are one of the unique birds that adopts the offspring of other birds. And he took those little pigeons, baby pigeons, 
and put them in the dove's nest and the doves adopted them and raised them. And I thought the Bible says in Romans that we're given a spirit of adoption. That's the Holy Spirit. And, you know, this whole thing is about, you know, that we're teaching about the supernatural and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, I love what he said. It's kind of the, the whole entry level to this is that it's not about, you know, little fascinating, you know, f- things we can brag about. It's really about a relationship with God and with the Holy Spirit and the love of God. And it's the love of God that helps these gifts operate. I think that I, I can't help but agree. When Paul talks about the spirit of adoption, he says it, it witnesses. It provides, the word, word means provides evidence. It provides evidence at the core of our being that we're his well-loved child. And once that happens to you, it isn't that you got a hold of an idea. It's that the reality of God's love got a hold of you. And that love is an experience, not just an idea. I think that's why I asked him the question about when you're in a church, how many people do you think in this church meeting right now have had the experience of the love of God shed abroad in their heart? And if I ask uh, in a meeting, and I often do this, I'll say, how many, how many people here had an experience of God's love in the last week? And maybe one in a hundred hands go up. How many people have had this experience in the last two weeks? A couple more hands. How many people have had this experience a year ago? Some more hands. What we find is this stretching out into the past where people are remembering back a long way to when they had their last experience of God's love. And yet Paul says we're to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. This should be an experience that we live in. And the tragedy, Bob, is in many meetings I've said, how many people have never had an experience of the love of God? And a whole bunch of hands go up. But there, everyone in that room will tell you God loves me. But not everyone in that room has experienced it. And it's wow. the experience that makes the difference, not just the idea. Wow. I love what he said. Just yeah. loved it. Well, I'm looking forward to our next meeting with him. So it's going to be exciting. And those of you that are watching, you know, uh, it, we'll be posting it soon. So we'd hope you go on and watch the next part because he's got so much to share. Yeah, I loved his one more thought. I loved where he said, the spiritual gifts aren't trophies, they're tools. You know, it's not about me. Look, hey, look at my spiritual gift. Isn't it wonderful? Different people carrying different toolkits to do different jobs, building the same house. I just thought that that analogy was perfect. Amen. So we'll see you all on the next one. Amen. It's going to be great. You've been listening to the Reluctantly Supernatural podcast with your hosts, Mark Cowpersmith and Bob Maddox. Be sure to check out our website at www.reluctantlysupernatural.com or visit our YouTube channel, Reluctantly Supernatural, for more videos and podcasts. To get a copy of our book, Reluctantly Supernatural in an Age of Reason, you can purchase it at amazon.com or order it directly from us at our website, www.reluctantlysupernatural.com. Thank you.